الرحيم وصلى الله على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوه الا بالله العلي العظيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته In our previous two sessions we were examining the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him buni al-islamu ala khams shahadati an la ilaha illa Allah wa anna Muhammadur Rasulullah wa iqam as-salat wa ita'i az-zakat wa hajj al-bayt wa sawmi Ramadan and we said that these are the five pillars or supports of the religion you know i once asked a christian apologist who was trying to to basically argue uh, against the quran if he knew the five pillars of islam right so surely if you presume to have enough knowledge to argue against the quran then you then surely you know the five pillars i mean it's so basic now remember he said oneness of god and prayer and that's when he sort of just got stuck and that was it so he got stuck after number 2 i read an article once in a christian magazine called uh, the greatest book never read it was by a christian author that was the title of the article the greatest book never read and it was about the bible and so this christian author he was or journalist he was criticizing his fellow christians and he concluded in this article that 50% 50% of christians that attend church cannot even name the four gospels in the new testament they don't even know the names of the gospels and these are christians who actually go to church and when i mentioned this to one of my teachers he said well probably 50% of muslims coming out of salatul jumuah can he, cannot even quote one hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in arabic just one hadith so that's a problem this is a crisis of knowledge among muslims there are muslims in our communities who have you know bollywood movies <laughs> memorized from start to finish but they can't quote a a hadith to save their lives they don't prioritize and they don't even try but that's the thing though that the tongue is the revelator of the heart in other words you can determine who or what a person loves uh, by what he's always talking about unless he's a hypocrite but that's a whole different animal what are people talking about all the time there are people who are constantly talking about food or uh you know cryptocurrency you know bitcoin people talking about women or men all the time people talking about social media something they saw on tiktok if if one claims to love allah and his messenger but can barely read the quran and cannot quote one statement of the messenger whom one claims to love uh then that's a problem we need to recognize uh, that problem now interestingly even though fasting is one of the essential supports of the religion the quran uh contains only one passage consisting of five verses so five ayat that deal explicitly with fasting so al-baqara 183 to 187 however the quran is a book as i say is teeming with meaning that is to say it is an extremely polyvalent text it has multiple layers of meaning um and has an incredible wisdom density why is that because it's the ultimate i.e the last revelation of god it has to stay relevant until the saa until the eschaton until the end of time it was either sayyidna umar or ibn umar who said if i lost the halter of my camel i would know where to find it in the quran so that's true dedication true dedication to the quran is when the quran becomes your ultimate source of guidance in all of your affairs from the mundane to the spiritual from the lowest to the highest over the centuries our exegetes have written thousands of pages explaining these five ayat because the Quran is an ocean according to Imam al-Ghazali he calls it al-bahr and it's an ocean that keeps on giving as long as we keep fishing right so that's the caveat we have to stay engaged Imam al-Ghazali he said that a lot of muslims are stuck on the shore on the beach satisfied with the outward the basic outward meanings of the Quran he said dive into the ocean of its meanings and collect its precious jewels its rubies and pearls 
Um, and by rubies, he means the theological verses of the Quran, the verses that describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and give us the ma'rifatullah, int intimate knowledge of God. And by pearls, he means the verses that describe the way to Allah, the silat al mustaqim. So you have orthodoxy and you have orthopraxis. So let's take a closer look at one of these ayat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 183 of Al-Baqarah, Ya الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم كما كتب على الذين من O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you, just as it was prescribed upon those before you, لعلكم تتقون, which can be taken as a purpose clause, meaning in order for you to have taqwa. Now allow me to preface my comments about taqwa by saying the following, a severe difficulty, and I've mentioned this before in, in talks in recent times, but I think it's very, very important, it must be reiterated, that a severe difficulty that many Muslims face today is a loss of faith, a loss of iman um, among themselves, among their family members and friends and relatives. And I think this is due to several factors. Well, number one, ignorance, right? Jahal. You know, a simple lack of knowledge, not knowing. But number two, which is just as bad and maybe even worse, is the proliferation of misapprehension. Um, in other words, think, thinking you know, thinking you know something when you don't know it. This is called jahal murakkab, compounded ignorance. For example, somebody came up to me uh, once and said, the Quran advocates violence. Right, and was trying to convince me into believing that the Quran advocates violence. And this is someone who um, probably uh, read some article last weekend or something about the Quran. And, and I said, well, you know, I've been studying this text for many, many years. He said, no, 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 you don't know. This is what he's trying to tell me. The Quran actually advocates violence. So this is someone who, this is somebody who, who doesn't know the truth, but thinks he knows, right? This type of Jahal uh, Murakkab, it's, it's a very, very bad state. And then, of course, the third reason, the popularity of trendy modern philosophies and social movements. Of course, there is atheism, and atheism goes back thousands of years in the West, probably as far back as Democritus. But since 9-11, there has been a renewed fervor of atheistic discourse. Some call it new atheism. In my, in my opinion, it's really anti-theism. In other words, they're not simply arguing that there probably is no God. Um, they argue that even if there is a God, that we shouldn't obey him. This is their attitude. It's not this idea that all you know, religions are meaningless, but if it floats your boat, then go ahead. No, they're saying that religion is actually evil, that religion needs to be eradicated. Uh, this sentiment was captured accurately by the late Christopher Hitchens, who said, there is no God, and I hate him. That is anti-theism. Now, there is one thing that all of these anti-theists have in common. They never study traditional or normative theology. They always focus on the social, and, the social impact of religion. So Islam is bad because of suicide bombers, or because of these fools called ISIS. Christianity is bad because of pedophile priests um, uh, and the KKK. I mean, that's the only card they have to play, right? The social impact of religion. And then when theists do the same thing to them and say atheism is bad because of Mao and Lenin and Marx and Stalin, they say, no, 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 you're misrepresenting us. You're misrepresenting us, right? It was very, very interesting. And of course, there's something called uh, existential nihilism, right? This idea that life has no meaning, it doesn't matter, we're all Sisyphus, right? We're all rolling up these boulders up, up, up these mountains, life doesn't have any meaning, uh, there's no higher telos, there's no purpose, just maximize your pleasure, because YOLO, right? You only live once, it's all about hedonism, whatever feels good, as long as you don't harm anyone else. That's the caveat they usually give. It's kind of John Stuart Mill, the harm principle. So it's the age of feeling, right? Robert George, this is what he calls the time that we're living in, right? There was the age of faith, there was the age of reason, but now it's all about feeling. Nowadays, things are no longer defined by you know, a sacred text or by the intellect, but by your feelings. 
We will continue with our reflections in the next session, inshallah ta'ala. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa